everyone. I'm Heidi from Cameo, the California Association for Micro Enterprise Opportunity. We're going to wait a couple of minutes. Um, but it is 11 o'clock, and as far as my watch is, says, but we had a um, bunch more people who signed up, so we're going to hang tight for a minute. So if you could just be a little patient. Do I see Jesse Torres? <laughs> you so, do. You do. They're so good. Hello to People everyone. On this list. Constance. Hello to everyone. Hi, Constance. Wow. Hi, Heidi. How are you? I am superb. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Not many people are superb these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, good. I'm Stretch a little and say, I my favorite word is fabulous, but right okay. now I'm just going to go. I'm hoping that that takes it even to the next level. I'm going to have to camp. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that is good to hear. And it seems like we're getting critical mass. And so why don't we get started? Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Heidi Pickman. I'm the um, VP of Programs and Policy at Cameo, and welcome to all everybody. It's great to see a lot of people that I know and a couple of new people that I don't, so welcome. Um, Melissa, next slide. Just a couple of tidbits on Zoom etiquette. Um, if you take your cursor um, to the bottom, everybody knows where the mute button is. You should be, most everybody should be muted. So I see a couple of you aren't, just to keep the background noise to a minimum. So if you could do that for, for me. And there's also the chat. We're going to heavily use the chat. We like we like the chat box. Um, also, it, I don't. one of the other things that people might not know is if you go to the top of your screen, this isn't on the slide, you see view options where there's a thing, a little green bar that says you're viewing Melissa's screen and view options. Um, if you click on that, you'll see side by side mode. And if you click on that, you can see see slides and the gallery or the speaker view, however you want to do it um, on side by sides. And you make can make the slides bigger or smaller depending on your preference. So there's um, a little two little bars between the people and the slides. And if you click and drag on that to the left, people go bigger or slides go bigger if you go move it to the right. So a um, little, I don't know if people have found that yet. Um, we're recording and I think this is gonna be a good one to share with your other staff. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, also, we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of the slides. So you don't need to put that in chat and ask. We will definitely do that for you. Um, next slide, Melissa. Um, just a little bit for those of you who don't know um, who Cameo is with a statewide network of entrepreneurial trading programs, um, like you all, um, the SBDCs, WBCs are members, we do capacity building advocacy, um, play a convening role, and it's kind of, that's, this is doing double duty here. We're doing a little bit of capacity building by giving you some information on cybersecurity, and we're also doing some... Um, convening and collaborating with um, our entrepreneurship advantage. We are super busy in the next um, few weeks. We thought, you know, the end of the year, you ramp down. No, everybody's been ramping up all year long. You guys are on the front lines. Um, we are involved in the California Rebuilding Fund in helping all the trainers and the SBDCs, WBCs, other nonprofits that do training. Um, do um, be have up to the minute knowledge on what you need to know for the California Rebuilding Fund and how to get your clients funded by that. Um, it is going to be an ongoing program, um, so never fear. Um, we had a training on uh, Monday 
And Melissa, you can pop um, that link in if you guys want to go back and listen to that. And Melissa also just, um, Melissa, I think you're only in the waiting room here. So, um, <laughs> um, so if you could, um, pop the, we also could put, she's also going to pop the registration to the November 12th train the trainer. We'll go over, do a live demo of the application, um, do, um, review the product and start to work on profitability. So if you, you or any of your staff members need some training on profitability, that's the place to go. Um, we'll also have one on December 4th. Um, that link's not up there yet. We'll make sure you get the link. It's upcoming. So don't worry about it just yet. We'll finish the um, profitability stuff if, if we didn't get to it on the 12th and then work on um, credit, reading credit memos and um, calculating debt to equity ratio. So there's a lot tied up in there. So feel, you know, love to help you, your staff um, manage, do that. Um, on November 19th, um, it's mostly for lenders. Um, so if you're a lender, we're going to be talking about managing lending risk in times of crisis and working with the state loan guarantee fund. So if you are a lender or know a lender, want to um, please join us for that. Um, we'll also be facilitating some fun activities with the FDCs, kind of getting to know each other. Um, lot going on. Like I said, next, also, um, Michael, we have micro lending essentials. If you want to, um, learn more about my, underwriting a micro loan or preparing your clients for, um, a micro loan, micro lending essentials is for you. Or if you know, but you know, a staff member who might need help, then please go ahead and, um, send Melissa an email. We're almost, we only have a couple of slots open left for this. It's going to start November 10th and we're starting to collect um, names for um, our a January slash February um, start date. So please um, let us know if that's something that is interesting to you. Um, and then not j just, we, you don't have to put the regional meetings in here, um, I, Melissa, um, the NorCal, and I wanted you guys to know, we don't only convene LA people, but we also convene people all over the state. Um, in, on the third, we're having a meeting with our, with our NorCal um, folks, and on the eighth of December, we're meeting with our Sacramento folks. So, um, if you have colleagues in those things, um, just um, forward, forward Melissa. Uh, you see her email. It's right there. Forward Melissa. Her um, say, hey, this person would be great for you guys to meet. And we'll go ahead and send them an invitation. And of course, we have our coronavirus resources for small businesses. You can find that from our homepage. So we're pretty busy here and I am way over time. So I am going to turn it over now um, to talk about convening LA and turn it over to Frank Stokes of the Best Mobile Accelerator. He's founder and creator um, of both the El Camino College Business Entrepreneurial Success Training Program and the West Los Angeles College Business Entrepreneurial Stewardship Training. That's the best training um, program. And it's, he's assisted hundreds of dislocated and laid off workers who have um, wanted to start their own business, just something that Cameo um, has advocated for uh, much over the years. And he's a cherished member of the EA Steering Committee. Frank, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce EA and tell us about what we're going to do today. Great. Thanks very much, Heidi. And uh, again, I want to welcome each and every one of you who are joining us today. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. And uh, you're very valued. We appreciate your presence. Uh, today's uh, agenda is, uh, we have a special guest we'll get to, but it's building digital resiliency. Uh, which of course is, is paramount today because we've just been accelerated, uh, whether we like it or not, into a digital age and everything is uh, remote. Face-to-face -face has been removed for the moment. We'll get back to it at some point, but uh, in order to sustain, this is a very important topic. So we're happy to have this presentation today. And after of course, we'll have questions, answers, and a brief discussion. All right, uh, now uh, I would love for us to have the opportunity to, for introductions, but I see we have quite a few 
uh, maintained. So what we will ask here is each one of you to uh, make sure we have your name, your organization, and your role. And I would also encourage you to share your uh, contact information, websites, uh, things of importance to this particular mission. So uh, let's make sure that we know that who you are and that we can follow up with you, especially if it's, this is your first time joining us. So name, organization, any brief message, and let us know what your role is. And of course, uh, this is just the beginning if this is the first time. All right, thanks very much. Okay, just a brief overview. The purpose of Entrepreneurship Advantage or our mission is to create economic opportunity for entrepreneurs and small businesses and uh, we'll have to say micro enterprises as well in Los Angeles County by connecting human, technical, and capital resources through regional collaboration. And um, again, this our, when we were meeting originally, there we knew there was a lot of activity, a lot of good work being done in Southern California, but it was not connected. So we were uh, wanting to, and that's our mission, is to create this ecosystem so that there's a lot of connectivity and we know who the answers to who, where, who does what, and, and we can provide services and find solutions for those that we're serving uh, much better. Uh, additionally, uh, we're here to bring uh, EA members together to discuss best practices and strategies to share some of our challenges and even our successes in light of the COVID-19 pandemic effects uh, that we're all witnessing that's taking place in the small business sector. So uh, that's why, again, your presence is greatly appreciated so that we're all working on these things together. Now, uh, our topic today is digital resiliency and COVID-19. And of course, a couple of things that are really important here is that responses to the pandemic have speeded the digital adoption by several years. Something that was gonna happen anyway has been accelerated in a matter of a few months. And many executives believe that these changes could be long-term according to McKinsey and company. And according to a recent SBA survey, nearly nine in 10 business owners felt their business was vulnerable to cyber attack. Uh, however, many small businesses can't afford professional IT solutions don't have time to focus on cybersecurity or just simply don't know where to begin. Now today we'll focus on how you can improve digital resiliency in your organization or business. We have a special guest with us today, Mr. Jesse Torres. And Jesse is the principal of Royal West LLC, a consulting firm here in Los Angeles. He is the former small business advocate for the state of California and Deputy Director of Small Business and Innovation for GoBiz under Governor Brown when he secured more than $108 million in state funds for the federal small business technical assistance providers. And proud to say he is the chair of Cameo's Board of Directors. So without further ado, I introduce to you Mr. Jesse Torres. So we'll turn the floor and the floor over to you. And thank you for being here, Jesse. Absolutely. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Heidi, Melissa, Carolina, for the invitation and the opportunity to present to uh, an amazing group of participants, a lot of familiar names. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you, especially during this time. I know it can be very difficult to uh, spend time away uh, focusing on things like digital resiliency. So, you know, what I wanted to do is just give you a sense of what we're going to be covering um, here. You know, it's, it was funny because when Heidi Melissa reached out to me about the idea of participating and uh, doing a, a discussion presentation on cybersecurity, uh, you know, as you can imagine, there's so many different directions you can go. I mean, cybersecurity, as I was just talking with Melissa about, it, it's almost like saying to somebody, okay, we want you to talk about space or clean tech. 
it's a really this uber sector that touches pretty much everything we do now. And so it can be very difficult to just drill in on a certain piece of it. Uh, for today, we're really gonna be talking about digital resiliency. And I'm really gonna come at it as the lens of, okay, for those of you, I know many of you are in the, in the work of helping small businesses and really want to provide helpful tips about how you can frame that, uh, you know, what are some practical strategies and what are just some basics of, okay, here are some simple things people can do to, to protect themselves, protect their data, but it's really going to be around kind of data protection where we're going to be drilling in on. Um, and I'll say upfront, you know, I am not an IT expert. I am not the guy who can help you find, you know, the best products to buy, that kind of thing. But what I think I'm getting good at is helping think about frameworks and, you know, how do you support small businesses and help them get protected from all kinds of potential disaster scenarios. So we'll dive into that. But let's take a quick look at Let's see if we can jump to the next slide. Uh, just a little bit more about me, and I won't go into all this, but uh, let me just kind of share how I got into the cyber security world. Uh, I was the regional director for the Los Angeles Small Business Development Center for a number of years. And there was, uh, you know, we would do these um, annual meetings with our entire team. And at that time, I think this was 2012, 2013, I can't remember which year, I know Star and Constance would probably know better, uh, but we had our training and we wanted to bring in an expert to talk to our advisors. We have, you know, close to a hundred advisors under contract uh, working with small businesses. And the concern at that time was that everybody was using, you know, starting to use laptops, starting to meet with business owners where they were and doing work uh, you know, remotely. And so we really need to have a new kind of sense of, well, how do we make sure that our records are being protected? You know, what can we do to make sure that our clients feel like their, um, you know, their confidential information is being secured? And so we actually invited the U.S. Secret Service to come in and do a presentation to our team about just the basics of, of uh, cybersecurity, cyber resiliency. And then they actually invited me to participate in a uh, task force, uh, you know, that uh, was at that time called the Los Angeles uh, Cyber Enforcement Task Force, if I remember correctly. Now it's called the Cyber Fraud Task Force, which is essentially a group of, uh, you know, technical assistance providers, firms that are, you know, interested in cybersecurity and, and thinking about best practices. But it was really that, that was the first time I really started diving into the world and started thinking about, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that we're protecting ourselves, protecting our digital data, protecting our client records. Uh, when I went to go work for the state as a small business advocate, and the work uh, continued. Uh, one of the major grants I had to oversee was the Cascade Grant, which was a program to help uh, essentially contractors, uh, manufacturing firms in California uh, become more cyber resilient. Uh, the federal agencies were requiring now that uh, these firms had a cybersecurity plan. Uh, many firms didn't. Many firms didn't know the first thing about how do you get into compliance. Uh, and we did a lot of work in helping manufacturers really think about cybersecurity um, and what they need to do to protect themselves so they, they could actually pursue federal contracts, uh, which I think many of you are now seeing that that is now becoming the norm. You know, if you apply for, say, a contract with LA County or the state, it would be now be unusual if you didn't have to include a cybersecurity plan around that. And, uh, you know, many folks don't even have an IT person, let alone a cybersecurity plan. And so that's, that's become a bigger issue. Uh, the other work I did there at GoBiz was around things like uh, we did a cybersecurity challenge for students because there's a big talent gap around cybersecurity uh, positions, especially here in the state. Um, and then just in general, what we started noticing is that a uh, cyber attack was becoming a bigger issue. Um, and really as we were started doing natural disaster work, uh, I became noticing that, you know, we needed to make sure that cyber attack was really included as a preparedness, uh, you know, kind of uh, thought, you know, where you, we needed to consider cyber attack as just as challenging or, or daunting as say a fire or earthquake. And we need to help business owners really become prepared in that kind of way. But let's jump into the next slide. Um, cause you know, one of the reasons why this is becoming such a, um, an important thing to think about, to consider and to develop a framework about is that unfortunately, you know, these cases are on the rise, you know, what you see here on the slide is just a, uh, a more recent survey. This is, if you ever do a search for data, this is probably one of the surveys that gets mentioned quite a bit. Uh, it was a survey done of both U S and UK businesses, uh, small and medium size back in 2018. They are surveyed about a thousand, a little bit over a thousand. And what they found is that 67% had suffered a cyber attack. 
uh, the majority said, and this is really important, that it was really a, a lot of the data breaches were due to just a negligent employee or independent contractor, you know, human behavior. And, and that's something they should all really understand is that often the reason why things happen and why a situation occurs is because of human behavior. You know, somebody plugs in a flash drive or opens a file that they shouldn't. You know, I've been, you know, praying that myself. And in fact, this summer, uh, I got an email from someone from a major economic development agency that looked totally legit. And then I realized it wasn't legit. And so just know that, that this is a common, a common issue. Um, especially now as we're getting much more mobile in the work that we do, uh, you know, the, the survey noted that mobile devices are the most vulnerable entry points for companies' uh, computer networks. So just a quick, you know, kind of reason why is this data set of like, okay, the, if the cases are on the rise, small businesses are being impacted. And unfortunately, during a disaster event like COVID-19 pandemic, you see a surge in this kind of attacks, ransomware, phishing, et cetera. And so it's really important to start thinking about, okay, as we help business owners navigate through disaster scenarios, how can we incorporate cyber resiliency as part of that preparedness? So let's jump into the next, next slide. So really what, what I wanted to do is kind of first talk about, okay, as you think about a framework of preparedness, how can you start bundling it in? And uh, let's go to the next slide. And so one of the things that I've been doing this past summer, uh, and this is strictly as a, you know, a contractor, I, I've been helping the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency and the California Academy for Economic Development, so, which is the nonprofit arm at Khaled, implement the Outsmart Disaster Campaign, which was a campaign uh, really meant to provide practical strategies to uh, both small business owners and small business stakeholders about preparedness at large. Uh, it really started off as a as a campaign kind of around earthquake. You know, how do you help people recover and, and become resilient to earthquake? And it's since become expanded to cover all types of natural and man-made disasters. Uh, we see there is the framework for uh, one of the core components of the campaign called the Resilient Business Challenge. And you see here just the big buckets around. Um, helping people think about, okay, what is the step-by-step -step approach you can take to resilience? Uh, one of the key aspects that we drill in on is around, you see there in the middle, secure and protect, which is a really talking about, okay, digital resiliency. But, you know, really, we when we start doing this work, and we do, we've done trainings, we've done individual consulting to businesses and to small business community stakeholders, you know, really what we're trying to do is say, look, Right now is a really good time, even in the midst of the pandemic, to think about preparedness, to think about resiliency, and to, at the same time, think about what is the connection with resiliency and cyber resiliency and cyber preparedness. Um, let's jump to the next slide. You know, the, the core work, if you ever look at the national, the, the national preparedness framework, really a, a lot of it is around risk assessment and it's the basics. And this is not going to be really, uh, you know, anything... Uh, you know, truly, uh, I think, unknown as far as how you should think about preparedness. But I just want to show this slide because it shows especially the principles, you know, uh, of what preparedness involves. And, and I promise you this will tie into cyber resiliency. But we see here is that with anything, if you start thinking about risk and risk assessment, there's a few core components. You know, first, you got to identify, okay, what is the potential hazard? Uh, what assets do I have that are most at risk? And then the nature of the risk itself, you know, how likely is it? How, what is the likelihood of the duration? You know, what would the impact be upon my operations or my financial condition? You know, and then from there, you can summarize a better understanding of what is my current vulnerability? And then how do I take action to prevent this from happening to me or to mitigate the massive impact? And so as you guys are now in the work, and I think all of us are of preparedness and resiliency, know first that there is national frameworks, there's a national, you know, understanding of how you can start to approach it and how you can start to educate your clients, your business owners. And what you see here on the slide is really kind of the main principles of that, you know, uh, identifying the hazard, developing a risk assessment, and then creating a mitigation plan around it. Let's jump to the next piece. And this is just another example of, oh, how do you help people actually do that? You know, you, you do scenario analysis, you help them understand, okay, in the case of, say, a fire or cyber attack, you know, you can start doing scenario analysis, you can start doing risk assessment, you can start to really kind of patch through the vulnerabilities and really, you know, kind of go from there. Um, let's go to the next slide. But really what I wanted to drill in is talk about 
this, this third element of what we cover in our OutSmart training, which is around securing and protecting. And how do you actually start breaking down the principles of digital resiliency as part of preparedness framework? Uh, next slide, please. So when you start thinking about, this is where you start getting to like the nitty gritty of, okay, how do you actually start safeguarding data? How do you start thinking about uh, digital resiliency? <clears throat> you know, it really starts first with this concept of what we like to call vital records. And, and when it comes to vital records, you, there's really kind of two, two directions you can go. There's like the physical approach of vital records. We actually have documents that are really important to your business that you got to make sure are protected, you know, things like lease agreements or contracts. And then there's more of the digital world. You know, there's things that you're having uh, stored in your computer. Uh, you know, there's important emails, there's data tables that you're, you know, collecting. And where I think a lot of folks have really come to understand is, that, you know, there's a lot of practice around, okay, how do you protect your physical records? But I think there's still a lot of work to be done around the digital side of it. You know, how do you start thinking about protecting digital assets? And what does that look like? What is the, what are some best practices to, to actually start thinking about that, to teach others about how you can approach that work. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So there's really, you know, a few key pieces uh, or steps that are involved in securing vital records or data. You know, there's the idea of taking inventory, uh, you know, to doing a, a backup to the data that you have, to having a recovery plan, um, and then testing your plan. And I would say that, you know, what you see here is the basic principle of any type of kind of disaster scenario or, you know, disaster assessment, the idea of, you know, what assets are important to you, how would you protect it, what is your redundancy system, what is your plan to get back on your feet, and then are you testing this plan again and again? Um, and, you know, it, like I said, it's, a lot of this is in rocket science, but it's in how you apply it to things like uh, digital records or cyber resiliency that becomes really important because there is some nuance uh, to that that is very different from, say, how do I protect my essential business process of sales or, or et cetera? Uh, let's jump to the next slide. So, you know, let's, let's kind of break it down from here. Um, and, and of course, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, I'll try to definitely answer along the way or, or any, anything you just want to throw out as far as comments, you know, please feel free to do so. I want to make, make sure that you guys get your questions answered or, you know, your concerns uh, discussed. But let's kind of walk it through. Okay, what is what does it mean to take inventory of your vital records? You know, how do you start approaching that? So, you know, the few kind of big questions you can ask, or the opening question you can ask yourself is, well, what is important to me? What is what is exactly vital? And so, how you can start thinking about it when it comes to um, protecting your digital assets is really looking at it from the lens of, okay is this data important to my organization, to my business? You know, is it critical to resuming business operations? Um, is it a legal or financial document that is key? Does it protect my stakeholders in any kind of way? Is it difficult to, uh, to reproduce or is it expensive to reproduce? You know, those are some good questions you can start asking yourself if you're trying to at the very beginning think about, okay, is this truly vital? Is this just truly important for me? And do I need to create a plan around protecting it? Um, because if you do this first, you can quickly uh, determine, okay, what do you need to spend your time on? You know, what is, what, is this really critical? Or is it just this thing I just had in my inbox or in my computer system, but it really isn't worthwhile for me to create a massive plan of recovery around it? Because when I look at it from this lens, it really isn't critical. And so just like with everything else, you know, figuring out what is priority becomes really important because that's how you're going to spend your time and effort in thinking through, okay, well, what do I need, what steps do I need to take around recovery of this, of this particular asset? Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so how can you think about, okay, uh, you know, uh, as far as like tearing it out, you know, the, the, I guess the more of the, the vitalness of my data, you know, and you, what you see here is just a, a recommended approach. You know, once you've figured out that something is truly vital, uh, and then it, will, it becomes important to think about, well, how soon would you need it? If you if it somehow got lost or needs to be recovered, well, how fast would you need it back in order to get back to some kind of normalcy? Is it tier one where you need it immediately? Is it tier two where you need it within 24 hours? Is it tier three where you need it within a few days? You know, if you can start to tier the data, you can start developing a more detailed plan around recovery resiliency, but it can be very difficult 
to even move forward from this stage if you really haven't done that assessment of, okay, this is what I think is essential to me as far as a digital asset. This is how fast I would need it if it get, becomes lost or damaged. And then from there, you can start doing much more extensive kind of strategic planning. Uh, we see there in the link, and I know we'll, we'll show the slides, there's actually this really great kind of checklist about how you can start classifying your vital records, your data sets, um, that can be really useful as far as doing this initial exercise of thinking through, okay, is this essential or not? And if it is essential, how fast would I need it if it goes away? Uh, let's go to the next slide. And Jetsy, this looks, yeah. that looks like a, something that everybody could do with their clients, right? I mean... Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's kind of the same thing where, you know, like with everything, a client will come in and they'll, they'll think that everything is important, right? You know, they'll think that everything's priority um, or they think that everything they do is priority, you know, and as you all know, one of the first things you can do is really sit down with them and say, well, let's really see, you know, uh, what is key to you? What is really critical to keeping your business up and running, to your livelihood? And, and once you do that first initial step, everything from there flows, you know, you can figure out, it, it's just like, it's just like a, almost a little financial resiliency. It's like, okay, well, what is your essential business process? What is your essential operation? Once you understand that and, you know, um, and the likelihood of a disaster scenario, you can figure out, well, how much cash would you need to keep it going? You know, what, what system would you need in order to maintain this operation, right? It's the same practice. It's just that when it comes to digital resiliency, you're applying it to a data asset. You know, you're thinking about, okay, is this email list really that important or is it much more important that I digitize my financial records and have it in cloud storage and have a redundant system around it? Um, hopefully that, that makes sense. Oh, totally. Yeah, um, but let's keep diving into, into these steps here. Um, so, and then from there, the next step is thinking about, well, how do you, if it is truly important, if you do need it, if you understand how fast you would need it, um, then you can start thinking about, well, how do I protect it? Uh, you know, what is my data backup plan? You know, do I have it secured at a particular location? Uh, is, is my backup process, is it, uh, you know, do I have a, a strength around it, is it protected? Am I doing regular automatic backups? You know, is everything being updated? Is my process by which I'm updating all this and protecting all my data, is that included in a business resiliency plan that everybody understands and my team understands that everybody uh, knows what to do in the event that say you become incapacitated, this, this everybody know exactly what needs to happen in order to recover this data should something happen. Um, let's go to the next slide. And then, you know, as you think about that and kind of fleshing out the plan from there, what you should also consider is, okay, well, how fast do we need access? What is the cost of having this data backup plan? Uh, you know, what considerations do you need to have around how sensitive the data is? And then in really, you know, who should be responsible for taking action in the event that this data becomes uh, somehow lost or needs to be recovered? You know, so the, what you see here in these steps is really essentially the, the components of a plan around digital resiliency and protecting your vital records. Um, let's go to the next slide. And really the last piece here is around testing your plan. So you've come up with this great plan about uh, that really kind of flushes out what is critical, you know, uh, how fast would you need it, how you're protecting this data, and who's responsible for making sure that, you know, uh, the recovery process moves smoothly. Well, you know, it's one thing to have a plan on paper. It's another thing to actually practice it and to test it and see if there's any weaknesses, if there's any vulnerabilities, if you haven't fully thought through exactly what would need to happen in the event of an incident. It is also really just good practice. I mean, it's the same thing as if uh, when you all do your scenarios with, um, you know, say an evacuation, like, okay, uh, there's a fire in the building. What do we do? Who's in charge? Who's manning the doors? You know, who's directing traffic? Uh, you know, you know, who's actually leading people outside? Well, you practice that. And it's the same, it's the same idea when it comes to digital resiliency, uh, when it comes to protecting your, your records, your data, you know, you need to have a plan, you need to test it out, you need to see if it works, if everybody understands what to do, uh, you need to see what would happen if say you yourself are not uh, able to actually participate in that effort, does your right hand, does somebody else know what to do? Does your business owner that you're educating, did they know exactly what to do? Have they tested out? their digital resiliency plan, you know, testing things and, and reassessing all critical kind of aspects uh, to this work. But let's jump into the next slide. 
And so it really kind of go a little bit further into the idea of resiliency and we could jump into, into the next slide here. Um, and so this is more, okay, well, how do you actually kind of, yeah, you know, it's one thing to do the framework, what are some real practical strategies of how you can do cybersecurity and what are some best practices around that? So I just want to do a little bit of that where maybe the first part of my presentation was around framework, the idea of how do you do resiliency? What does that mean? How does it get incorporated to a preparedness framework? Well, now let's talk a little bit about some nitty gritty stuff, some real kind of practical strategies about how you can, uh, you know, how you can feel more safe, how your, your business owners that you're supporting can feel more secure and safe in their work. So, you know, so just a few kind of key considerations. And again, this isn't rocket science, uh, but it's, uh, it's good to run through it again and talk about some of these real practical steps that you can take to feel more secure. So, you know, uh, amongst the first things you can do is really dedicate employees, you know, so if you're giving advice to a business owner, what you, all, what you probably want to lead with is, okay, well, who's in charge? Who's actually managing your data? Who's managing your network? Uh, who's handling the third party vendors that are doing your IT, you know, handling your cloud solutions, your hardware, your software, right? Uh, I know for many small business owners, it would be rare if they had their own IT person. You know, I, I myself, I, I have my own consulting firm. We're a small team. Uh, I use an, an outsourced uh, IT provider. Uh, I work with them directly, you know, but one of the first things when it comes to planning is think about, well, who has access to these people? Who's really connected to uh, those that are protecting my data, my hardware, my software? And then what is then from there, the strategy around physical security, things like boundary protection and encryption and to make sure that our business processes are being protected. Uh, but it can be very difficult to go into that realm if you don't have a good sense of who is responsible. And in many cases that can be the CEO or it could be uh, you know, part of the core kind of admin team, uh, but figuring that out first and figuring out who's responsible or who should be in charge is really important. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, they get into a little bit of the nuance here, but there's, you know, some key things you can do as far as uh, thinking about or considering cybersecurity. Um, you know, maybe the, the one thing I'll, I'll say is that one thing that we learned uh, there in the governor's office, and there were, there's a lot of discussion around, is that uh, in this uber interconnected world uh, where you can have a device that you think is fully safe, fully protected, um, can suddenly become unprotected once they get connected to other devices and other networks. Uh, you know, the best example I can, you know, share around that is the idea of like, okay, I have my own laptop, I have McAfee, I have, I have virus protection, I ask my IT, you know, service provider to layer on all my protections, et cetera, firewall, uh, you know, whatever. And then it is still vulnerable once I get online and get an email from people, you know, where somebody can send me something for email where now suddenly my system is now vulnerable. And there's a lot of thought and, and planning that should go into, you know, thinking through that piece, okay? You know, what is your plan? You know, how can you start thinking about resiliency from the aspect of being connected to all things and being connected to other digital devices? And so what you see here on the screen is just what we like to describe as considerations, you know, considerations that the company, that the firm should be thinking about, that the organization should be thinking about, uh, you know, um, how would you protect, if you have one device that becomes compromised, how would you prevent that device from infecting or impacting others? Um, you know, what is your workload protection process look like? You know, how are you using antivirus or other vulnerable vulnerability management tools to protect uh, the things, the processes you care about. Um, do you, are you fully aware of the assets you have? Have you done inventory of your software, inventory of your hardware? Do you know which pieces are updated as far as virus, you know, uh, tools, um, you know, the latest software? Have you done the, uh, the updates from Microsoft to really make sure that everything is, is up to speed? Because unfortunately, what we're discovering is that you might feel like your particular device is secure, but then when it gets connected to something else, suddenly it's not secure. And that has been, not, you know, the biggest challenge around cybersecurity is this uber connected world we're now in, where uh, you know now you're 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 subject to the vulnerabilities of others and how dangerous that can be. Um, you know, so it's been really kind of actually. I mean, the, like I said, the best example I can give you is, like I said, I've had all the latest you know technology applied to my laptop here at home, um, you know, to my, my technology. 
uh, but that still won't prevent somebody from potentially breaking into a Zoom meeting like right now and doing something crazy, right? And some hugging match to some computer. You know, if my son decides to go onto Roblox and start connecting with a stranger and the stranger sends him a file through message chat, you know, that could be a way they can get in. So there's all types of new kind of scenarios in which uh, there can be a, a data hack or a data attack that may not be as visible. But if you start doing the plan, if you start thinking through it systematically, you can actually, uh, you know, make some inroads as far as your own protection and the protection of your employees. Um, that's the, so, that's, yeah. a, that's a really good point, especially since everybody's working at home these days and the kids like have access and, and, and stuff and probably aren't, do you do, you do training with your children? <laughs> well, you know, it is, and it's kind of sad to me, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, and I think unfortunately people don't have those kind of conversations or, uh, and they really should, you know, I, I remember being really surprised, you know, not to go off tangent, but, you know, what my son plays Minecraft, he loves Minecraft, and I didn't even realize that they had, say, a chat feature until I happened to see it at, a, like, some demonstration, and realized, like, oh, people can interact with him, you know, and I didn't fully grasp that, uh, you know, there's been uh, cases with some of the most popular games where, yeah, you know, there's been incidents of, you know, bullying or, uh, you know, some, some weirdness happening in the file transfers, but, you know, doing that kind of, you know, it, it's good practice at home, too. you know, like this isn't just restricted to business, uh, you know, good business processes, but this is a practice you can do at home, you know, do your own assessment, do your own understanding of, okay, where are we most vulnerable, you know, and how do we protect that? How do we make sure that there's certain safety, you know, measures yeah. put into place, right? Well, I'm also thinking there's a lot of melding with, um, you know, everybody's working at home right now. And so just to make sure that your um, your kids aren't getting onto your work computers and things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Can you make these slides available to us? Oh, yeah. We Will said you send them afterwards? Yeah. We'll, we'll we, save on a note taking. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and let me just go through the rest of the slides in case there's other kind of questions here. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit more kind of, like I said, you know, cybersecurity is the kind of thing where you can go all kinds of different directions. And, and you know, there is definitely a craft to it. There are definitely many angles. There's, I would say, extremely sophisticated realms of cybersecurity. I'm going to show you just one, I would say, kind of, now you're entering this kind of tier, this other tier of cybersecurity and how you can start thinking about it. So what I have here, and this is just something that we like to share uh, because this is an international best practice around data protection and it's actually incorporated as part of uh, the, U the EU, the uh, European Union's uh, um, uh, data privacy law, which is the, the probably the most stringent law in the entire world. Well, if within their privacy law, they actually have a requirement that organizations provide a data protection impact assessment, otherwise known as DPIA. And what this is, is a tool process that allows for the identification, classification, or risk within a business. And it helps to determine if the process would compromise the privacy of customer staff or anyone that they hold. And I'll put a, you know links in there into uh, the chat for you guys to have this handy in case you ever want to check out the, the template. But what I thought I'd do is, you know, and this is more of a kind of higher sophisticated level, is show how, how this framework explains data protection in the event that it might be helpful for you. So let's go to the next slide. And I'll just kind of walk through the different components. So there's nine key considerations for this type of assessment. Uh, so like I said, you know, the first one is, I guess, you know, how to describe this, does business need to carry out uh, an assessment for this particular process. Kind of the, the question they're asking here is, is this data set, is this process truly important? Is it truly priority? And this is something we touched upon earlier in the presentation, you know, that first kind of analysis of, okay, is what I have here worth me spending a lot of time and effort to develop a protection plan around? Um, once you determine that it is, then you can start going through some of the nuance of thinking about, okay, well, how am I gathering or processing this data uh, is this, uh, is me protecting this particular data set, is this something I can do on my own or do I need to bring in experts to really handle this? You know, uh, like I said, I'm not an IT guy, you know, I, when I have an issue and I want advice, I talk to my IT solution provider and I ask them, you know, what, how do you think I can protect myself? What should I be thinking about? What is the latest and greatest as far as technology that I should incorporate into my own business? So same, same practice here. 
uh, you know, assess the necessity and proportionality of gathering and processing the data, you know, a lot of that kind of nuance of, you know, is this important for me to capture? And if it is, uh, you know, I would say what's, what's kind of interesting that in, in thinking about this particular bullet is that what we also have seen is that, uh, you know, big data, you know, it, it feels like businesses feel like they need to capture everything about a particular customer set or a particular, you know, thing that they're involved with or maybe they become at risk by even capturing that in the first place. And it's, you know, good practice even to have that conversation with the business owner. Is this really important to you? Do you really need to capture, say, everybody's, you know, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, you know, gender? Is this truly important to your business? Or is this data that you can let go because it doesn't really do anything for you? And by even having it in a store, you become vulnerable. You know, you put yourself at risk. So that's a really kind of interesting bullet here as far as the DPIA. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the other pieces here is around the, uh, you know, assessing the risk of the data, which we really just talked about, and the risk associated with that. Uh, what measures we need to uh, adopt, you know, to mitigate the identified risk. Uh, how, who is involved in the signing off and the recording of the outcomes that any decisions made around protecting this data. How do you integrate that, that effort into a, an overall plan, into your core objectives. And then how do you how do you reassess? So essentially, what they've done here is break it down into nine key steps. Everything we just talked about in the last you know twenty minutes or so, uh, but they do it in a much more succinct way. Um, but what I really wanted to show is that this is a, a, a you know this is a practice that's adopted internationally, and so but it, it's all the same it's all the same idea it's all the same concept it's just more in how do you explain it you know, and and what what's really useful is that it provides a framework for you to have a good conversation with your business owners or even for you if yourself if yourself you're really trying to figure out like how the heck would i actually start protecting myself yeah well here's some things some good opening questions some leading questions to help you think about how you can start approaching digital data and digital assets um, and protecting them uh, let's go to the next slide so what? So what's the point? Why why do any of this? You know, why does it matter? It sounds complicated. What is the value of doing this kind of exercise? So I just want to show you a couple of things. Let's go to the next next slide here. Uh, so like I mentioned, cyber attack is on the rise. Uh, the number of complaints to the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center has tripled since pre-pandemic times. They now get about 4,000 calls every every day, uh, where it used to be about 1,000. So definitely uh, what you're seeing, unfortunately, is more small business owners uh, becoming vulnerable. They're at risk. A lot of desperate people out there doing desperate things. Uh, you know, I can't imagine I'm the only one seeing just a flood of weird emails, phone calls, people trying to get access to me. So unfortunately, that's on the rise. Now is a really good time, even though everybody's stressed out, to have conversations around how are you protecting yourself digitally, especially if people are going to e-commerce and really trying to pivot their business model? You know, you, you, this needs to be brought up. This needs to be part of preparedness planning and any type of resiliency planning, um, at least in my view. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, and also, most importantly, you know, as I think all of us know, and this is data from the last J.P. Morgan Chase Institute study. You know, the median American small business owner only has about twenty-seven days of reserve as far as cash, uh, you know, for restaurant retail, it's really about, you know, 14 days, you know, I've been doing a lot of work directly with business owners here in LA County, I would say, most of them had about 10, 10, 14 days of cash reserve, you know, now it's not the time for anybody to be hit with a ransomware attack, you know, it's, now it's not the time to be worrying about, do I need to protect my, you know, my Zoom account, you know, how do I, do I need, if I need to pay somebody to, to help me uh, protect my e-commerce site. Right, so that every, if there's things that we can do, there's steps we can take to help people become more resilient because it's going to allow them to keep more of their cash and to not spend money on, on unnecessary things, then it's really important for us to do that, for us to think about how do we embed this idea of digital resiliency as part of our preparedness work at large. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know, the one thing I'll just encourage you, and there's only so much you can cover in, in this kind of short amount of time, and really what I've tried to do and, and hopefully done uh, effectively is say, you know, there's a whole world of cybersecurity. There's many different directions that you can go into. 
there's a lot of nuance you could get into for particular industries. I mean, we haven't even talked about things like point of sale systems or retail security or, or e-commerce security, because that is a whole study upon itself. Uh, what I just encourage all of you to do is keep learning, keep learning, keep exploring, keep practicing. Uh, there is a whole international community around cybersecurity and a whole international community around disaster preparedness. And, you know, I just want to encourage you to, to dig deeper, to, to become a, uh, a study of the work, because the more you can get familiar and feel to speak, uh, the better you're going to be for your clients and for those you care about. Uh, you know, one thing that I've just understood in the work that I've done is that people are often afraid to talk about cybersecurity because they feel like, well, I'm not an expert or I myself am, am subject to, you know, cyber attack. And so I don't want to really talk about it or dive into it. And that's a mistake. You know, I'll be the first to share with you that I've had a number of different dumb things I've done related to cyber attack. And so, you know, that is not a reason to not study it or be able to dive into it with your clients and to think about how do you, how do you do vulnerability ass assessment uh, for your own home. Um, and so just a next slide here, next couple of slides really showcases just a few things, a few places you can go to find out more. Uh, fortunately, a lot of federal agencies have dived really deep into cybersecurity. So SBA, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Commerce uh, really has some great tools uh, and, and best practices. This is just a sample of one from SBA, where they have, you know, how do you stay safe from cybersecurity threats? You see the link there. Uh, some of their suggested best practices, which, which I think are really some very practical things that you can encourage your, your clients or, or even for yourself to adopt. Okay, what is a good strong password? You know, um, what should I be thinking about related to multi-factor authentication, et cetera? And then I just want to show this next slide, which is the last slide. Um, you know, uh, FCC actually has a great cyber planner where you can actually uh, essentially create a customized plan based on your industry and your concerns. So if you want to say, you know, I just want to get the best practices around email security, you can select that and it'll give you, it'll generate a plan for you based on, you know, some great kind of models and best practices. So this is a really cool kind of tool that I just want you to showcase um, as if you're looking for just tools to, that you can use that are really easy templates. Um, both of those are, are, are great for you. But again, I just want to encourage you, there's a whole world of cybersecurity out there. I think FEMA also has some great kind of online uh, free uh, uh, trainings that you can adopt. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely happy to, you know, if you want to dive further into it, I'm happy to, you know, just give me a call, shoot me an email, happy to help you find, you know, resources. But I uh, hope that covers it. I know it's quite a bit. There's a lot we can talk about cybersecurity, but I just want to give you a quick snapshot of how you can start thinking about digital resiliency. But that's all I got. Jesse, thank you. That was that was so I think succinct and helpful as a place to start. It's like you know people are just their mind goes ah cybersecurity and you shut down so you don't do anything right. Yeah. And and so that was those are good tools. Um, what you've given us to take to our clients and get them to start to think about it. Um, I had a quick question if anybody, if, um, if, do you know, like, so we've backed up our stuff in Salesforce and we use Gmail and stuff like that. Are, are the big providers usually um, pretty safe? I mean, like what happens if Salesforce gets hacked? Like, <laughs> should we do something with our data in case sales, like, is that even a possibility, right? Definitely a possibility, uh, University of Maryland, <laughs> put out a study uh, not too long ago that said uh, there's a attack on a computer with access to the internet every 39 seconds. And so if you can imagine, you know, these firms have really, uh, you know, sophisticated systems around protection, uh, but it's often just a matter of time. It, 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 like, you know, cyber attack is a matter of when, not if. And so what you want to do, the, the mindset you should really have is how do I mitigate the damage so that it doesn't put me out of business, you know, uh, because small businesses especially are really subject to it. Um, and like I said, a lot of kind of what we're seeing is the discussion around human behavior, because it's often that, I mean, um, you know, quick couple stories, you know, uh, is the, you know, one of the biggest challenges is like somebody might click on something that they surely shouldn't, and then they don't tell anybody because they're afraid or they're embarrassed, right? And that's a mistake because you think you can't deal with the issue, right? Uh, you know, yeah. the, some of the major cyber attacks have happened because uh, uh, somebody left a, or somebody saw a flash drive in a parking lot 
and then plug it into the computer and it turned out to be, you know, Russian ransomware or something or phishing attack. And this is all common. And it's funny because like you think about it and, you know, I've actually, uh, I remember I had just done a, um, you know, an extensive training around, uh, you know, for the Cascade program for manufacturers. And I really felt like uh, working with the Department of Defense and all these people, and I feel like I'm a cybersecurity expert. And then I remember I got a call from my colleague in Sacramento saying, hey, we found a flash drive here on the floor of the office, and I'm pretty sure it's yours and has files in it. And I remember thinking, it is mine, because I was trying to move files from one computer to another, and it must have just fallen out of my bag. You know, so... Like I said, we can't be afraid to talk about this stuff, but we can't right. be afraid to say, to admit we're not experts, you know, and just, we do ourselves as a service. Because we're in LA, I just have like, this is like the screen, the screen, uh, what is it? A screen, screenplay, I could, sorry. Um, a screenplay idea where you could just imagine like there's like a cyber attack where everybody drops, you know, like a flash drive in the parking lot of all these different companies and where, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. um, does, does any, I was any, has anybody dealt with this with their client? Was one of their clients? Uh, dealt with? Yes, I, I have. Uh, I did share that in the chat though. It was six weeks ago. Oh, I missed, I missed that. Someone um, was on a Zoom meeting and they were knocked off of the, the meeting. They attempted to reestablish contact. At that point, their uh, unit was uh, taken over. They didn't have control over their unit. And they attempted to cut it off. He ended up just unplugging the um, laptop and uh, plugged it in sometime later to try to uh, you know, reboot, never was able to reboot. Uh, he took it to um, a uh, computer tech. They, they attempted, they couldn't do anything to reestablish uh, use of that laptop. So he just bought a new one and he did have the external drive. So he did have data to recover. They took the hard drive from the previous one to recover data from that. And um, he, he's able to continue, but that just happened wow. within the last six weeks. Wow, that's crazy. What yeah, did, yeah. That uh, anybody else deal with that with any of their clients? Well, so he had best practices where he was backing up. I mean, oh yeah, you good. you have that's to. And, yeah, uh, the externals are good, but you should be looking towards cloud solutions so that you can your data is remote somewhere you can get your hands on it. Yeah. A lot of people aren't thinking about that, but I'm, that's why I'm excited about this, Jesse, because it's so important. Because uh, you're out of business if you don't have access to your information. Yeah, and and Frank, but like Jesse was saying, like this cost this guy some oh. some bucks, huh? So that's right. yeah. Um, anyone else? Anybody have other questions? Have questions for Jesse? We have we have a couple minutes left. I'm sure he'll stay on if we do. Um, but that was like a, I, I just really enjoyed the, the concreteness and the, the a direction because I know I'm always, it's, it, like you said, it's like space. What do you do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the first step? Yeah, I think it's also just, uh, you know, since this is a, a, a local group, you know, if you guys have great resources and tools, best practices, share with each other. You know, don't hesitate and just even, uh, you know, Star just sent me a good resource card, Carb Carbonite for cloud storage, you know, if you guys have found that particular tools, devices work well through small businesses, you should share it uh, so everybody knows what the best practices are. Is there another topic if, no, I mean, people, you know, speak up. Is there another topic on cybersecurity that you're interested in? Are people interested in the e-commerce stuff or, or, or tools or anything? All right. Well, um, everybody give a big round of applause for to Jesse. Thank you so much, Jesse. As always, we totally appreciate you. 
and your willingness to share your expertise. And we are going to put this on the web so you can share it with your staff and your other um, colleagues, um, think, or your small businesses, right? They can, um, and we will share the slides so you can have the nine point, the nine steps or the four steps that take inventory piece that he started with. Um, so you can walk through through this with your clients or they can walk through it with themselves um, and also access some of those other, um, the other formats, the F FCC and the SBA that the SBA have. So thank you everyone. Have a great day and go back up your computer now. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.